Greetings. Welcome to the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. I'm Chuck Randolph, Ontic's Chief Security Officer. From 30 years as a military officer and over 25 transforming corporate security teams to function beyond their traditional roles, protection, risk management, and threat mitigation have been front and center throughout my career. This podcast series will explore the turbulent world of risk, security, and protective strategies through conversations with leaders and innovators in the field. Now, on to the discussion. I'm here with Rachel Briggs, CEO and founder of the Clarity Factory. Rachel is a leading expert on security and has advised governments and multinational corporations on security, resilience, terrorism, and response to extremism. She is also an associate fellow at Chatham House. The Clarity Factory conducts research, thought leadership, and consulting for corporate clients on corporate security and cybersecurity. Rachel was awarded an Officer of the Order of the British Empire by Her Majesty the Queen in 2014 for services to hostage families and kidnapped victims overseas. Rachel Briggs, welcome to the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Chuck. You know, I have spent more virtual time with you than a lot of a lot of my friends lately, and I'm saying that because it's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's um we've we're certainly doing a lot of work together and it's all of it is a lot of good fun and 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 you know producing some great stuff. So yeah, it's a pleasure. I, I, I was a little I was a little disappointed though. We were both on the same side of the pond. We did that amazing uh and thanks to Azis for hosting the both of us on the webinar regarding regarding security and it had so many folks on there and I'm in my hotel room in the UK and you're in your place in the UK. And I kept thinking like, man, it would have been great if we could have co-located to, to do that somewhere, but it just wasn't in the cards. It's crazy, isn't it? And, and there we were talking about a report that, that is called Connected Corporate Security. And we were in the same country and couldn't be in the same room together. So there's the irony, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what that is? I'm, I didn't, I, you know, I just made that irony uh, connection right there. Absolutely. We were there and we were talking about being connected. Yeah, but we were connected. I mean, exactly. Uh, me with my laptop precariously perched on the edge of a, uh, of a desk and, and you probably in your home office. Very comfortable in my home office, absolutely. Well, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to, I think, kind of come back and, and revisit some time with you, I know, Rachel, you've been on the Ontic Protective Intelligence podcast before, I think back in August of 2023, you and, and Dr. Rondazzo uh, had, a, had an episode where you basically were talking about correlation between diversity and innovation in the security industry, which was mm. a, a great listen, highly recommend anyone go back and find that. Um, but because we just had this, this joint report that you worked on, the Clarity Factory worked on regarding connected corporate security, we had an overwhelming, um, response on the, as this webinar and a lot of people asking questions, wanting to know a little bit more. So, you know, I thought it'd be great to kind of have you come back and, and dig into it just a little deeper, um, for just for those folks that maybe didn't hear that, that August, 2023 podcast, Rachel, before we start, like. Give me the preamble on Clarity Factory, why you started and in, in, in what, your, what your passion there is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been a couple of years now. I started it pretty much this time two years ago. Um, I am obsessed with data and insights, and <laughs> I am obsessed with um, using them to change things for, for the better. I got into my interest in corporate security because I had a family member kidnapped in Colombia many, many years ago. And thankfully, he came out alive, um, fit and healthy. Um, and but but it, the experience left me with a, a, a and and left me with a deep conviction that what companies do to keep their employees safe and by extension their intellectual property and their assets and so on and so forth it really matters you know when you don't get it right when you screw it up so there is a consequence and um so i've paired that conviction with um being a data nerd and an insight nerd um into um the clarity factory because i i love data i love insights and I love working with corporate security professionals to help them do the awesome job that they do, but just mm. maybe keep doing it a bit better, a bit better, a bit better. So um, I'm very much on that improvement journey with them. And um, 
it's it's great fun. It's a great community to work with. Well, and I would say I, I think you're one thing you do well, and I've I've known you since for many years, and I think again the idea of like look you're t- many corporate security professionals are in it every day they've got their sleeves rolled up they've got their pants rolled up they're they're helping dig ditches fight fires put fires out look for fires whatever the appropriate um, image might be and you're right they're collecting all this data they're collecting all this pocket lit and you've done a great job in saying what does this mean what are the insights that we can take away from this how should we be thinking so that when someone gets a break in in the issue, they can sit back and say, are we learning? Are we doing anything? Are we just continuing to do things the same way we do? And I think in your own way, you're kind of influencing people to think broadly, think three-dimensionally, and, and think beyond the, we're doing the same thing we did today that we did yesterday. So I've, I've always appreciated that about you. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think we're at a bit, a bit of a pivot moment in our industry and, and, and it, it connects really with some of the stuff that we'll no doubt cover today. But, you know, the world is changing beyond recognition in all sorts of ways. You know, the world of work, the world of business, all changing um, in, in many different ways. And it means that we as security professionals have got to change. We've got to take innovation seriously. We've got to, we're usually being asked to do more with less. and. Um, we, you know, we need to sort of tweak what we're doing in in, in sort of small and big ways. And what I find right. in working with, and, and a client said this to me just this morning, um, I'm helping them with um, a, a few different problems that they're solving. And they said, it would be really good if you could do X, because I just can't get to it. And X was the thinking, the benchmarking, the go and trawl everything anyone has ever written on that go and find us the framework go and do some thinking about how we could do this better because you know security functions are uh, they're not necessarily at breaking point but they are very stretched right now and but they many of the progressive ones recognize that there's a horizon that they need to look over that there are things that they need to change and so it's it's great fun and it's really rewarding actually working with security functions that are trying to stretch themselves um yeah. and if i can add some of that capacity some of the long range vision um and some of that lateral thinking then it's it's a it's a great partnership and it's it's very rewarding work to do well think about it in some ways there's a bit of a red teaming portion of this and by red teaming i don't mean like break into the building and you know show that you could zip tie me to a chair but uh, i i don't do that to be clear <laughs> <laughs> But the idea, though, where you come in and you say, hey, look, there's a hypothesis that you have or a um, perhaps it's a gut instinct, if you will, which we could go into the physiological issues around gut instincts. But then you take that and you say, look, I'm going to prove, prove, disprove or or make a modification on your observation. I mean, what a great place to be, you know, especially with all the work you've done in in. Um, counter or counterterrorism response to extremisms helping you know governments and multinationals with resiliency i mean it's a very fortunate place to be and i i imagine you never no two days are ever the same i guess no thankfully and one of the phrases that i learned when i lived in the in the us for 5 years which is one of my favorites is um it's where the rubber hits the road. I love that phrase, <laughs> and that's that's where that's sort of that sweet spot. You know, it's I I you know I could spend all of my time gathering data, and I'd be perfectly happy. And I could spend all of my time implementing stuff, and I'd be perfectly happy. But the sweet spot for me is where the rubber hits the road, as you guys say. Yeah. It's where those two things come together. It's that that middle bit of that of that particular Venn diagram. Um, yeah. that's that for me is the sweet spot. Well, you know, let, let's talk about some of the research you've done. Um, as, you know, we've collaborated uh, on TIC and, and the Clarity Factor on, on two previous reports. I think it was the business value of corporate security and empowering diversity, equity, and inclusion in corporate security. Um, any takeaways from those? And then how did that lead to this new report on connected corporate security? Yeah, so I've 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 been I've been running a, a series of different reports actually, and um, it's it's all very much part of a, a journey. The um, the business value of corporate security, which came out um, 
late last year and, and you're right we sort of collaborated i think on a a webinar off the back of that didn't we which mm-hmm. was which was fantastic and um it was always intended to be a vision for corporate security leaders to aspire to it was intended to be um a, a narrative framework that they could use to help to describe back to the rest of the organization what their value is um and, and in my view, that's really important because we talk a lot about metrics and numbers and how do we you know, improve return on investment. How do we, Actually, the first thing you need to do is, is get people around the table. And to do that, you've got to have a vision and you've got to have something that's emotionally and, and sort of mm-hmm. engaging in various ways. And so the business value of corporate security was really that vision. And um, I mean, really wonderfully, actually, I was ch- chatting to a CSO um, just a couple of days ago who said, you know, it just brilliantly capture, encapsulated for us what we do and what we're trying to do. And it helped mm-hmm. him to sharpen the narrative that he's now using with his executive committee. So that was very a very rewarding piece of feedback. Um, but what I, what, what I wanted to do coming off the back of that, of course, is then drill down into some more detail because it, the business value of corporate security is, is there's, there's detail as, as in there's data and there's some stats, but you know, my goodness, you could almost do five or six new research projects kind of going into each of the different elements of, of the narrative. And and that's what we did together, of course. And, um, you know, the, the one that we picked out was around connectedness, which mm-hmm. I see as, as really one of the, the biggest superpowers of the corporate security function. And so it was really good to have the opportunity working collaboratively with yourself and some of your other colleagues to say, okay, if this is the vision that we've set out in this previous piece of work, what does this really mean in practice? And what, um, and importantly, what does it mean for everyone in the function? Because right. I'm very conscious that a lot of my work tends to focus on the leadership level because it's about big change. Um, and actually, it was really refreshing to have to put myself in, uh, you know, it, it, looking at this from the perspective of multiple different people across a corporate security function and and hopefully empowering because it, it says actually we can all contribute towards this and this is how. Yeah, I, th- I think there's something to that as well in terms of like, you're right. I mean, we can talk to leaders all day. I, I am all for that. You are all for that. It You know, leaders have to set the tone. Leaders need to create clarity. They need to generate energy and they need to drive for results. And, and, and that's perfect. But then you have this, what I would call like classic, what, what was it? The, the old Harvard Business uh, Review article talking about middle management being both yeah. the center of gravity and the the single point of failure in any organization. Because if you don't bring that level, if you don't bring that level to the table and get their buy-in, then it's likely going to fail. So I, I think that was something that I thought when I when when we did the research and then I read the final report was like almost an almost an, an unsung element of it. Like, look, we need to engage at all levels. Connectedness happens at the top to the bottom, from side to yeah. side, from every corner of the business, but then also every corner internally to your to your team. Yeah. And I mean, look, you've only got to look at um, anything that's ever been written about change management to know that um, <laughs> the idea that change happens because somebody at the top of the tree says it should happen. We we know that's just not true. Um, right. Having leaders lead through change is really important. It's, it's I'm not saying it isn't, but it isn't enough. And um you know, we all know that power sits in different parts of the organization. You know, we all know that there yeah. are gatekeepers in organization. And if you're not friends with, you know, Joe in accounts, it doesn't matter what the CFO says, <laughs> Joe in accounts Amen. make it very difficult for you to get something signed off. So, so it's, um, so it's, it's a, it's a realistic um, recognition that change is not a top-down process, leadership matters, but yeah. a lot of other stuff matters as well. And Joe, that guy, I'm telling you. That I, guy, I Joe. You're, absol- you're absolutely my life. right. Bane of my life, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, le- uh, with, with regards to like the new report, I'm, you know, it, you know, kind of comes out, talks about within, across, between. But as you work through the data, as you say, you're a data nerd, and I think nerd is not a negative connotation for anyone. I also am that. Were there were there any big surprise? I want to talk about the takeaways, of course, but before we do that, were there any surprises for you that you said, huh, okay, 
I didn't see that or I hadn't thought about that or that was an aha moment for me? Well, as you said, we we took this structure in the report, which is about connecting within the function, connecting across the business and connecting between the business and the outside world, the sort of the within the across and between um, schema. And um, I think one of the things that I hadn't, and again, maybe it's because of my vantage point, one of the things I hadn't thought deeply enough was the was about the within bit. Um, you know, I I have have thought, read, written surveyed lots about um, why collaboration across the business is important for the corporate security function and why external networks are critical and actually we could draw more value from them. But um, I think before the ONTIC collaboration, I hadn't thought enough about um, the 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 sort of the quality and the quantity of collaboration within the function. Um, which was a was a shortcoming of mine. And so I'm really glad that we had the chance to to explore that a bit further because it has to like charity collaboration has to start at home right and um so it's it's right and fitting that that's where we start in the report we'll get back to the conversation in just a moment but first i wanted to tell you about the ontix center for connected intelligence in the world of safety security and protection we know that gathering and sharing information is crucial That is why we created the Ontic Center for Connected Intelligence. The center is a hub for the ongoing exchange of security strategies and best practices, insights on current and past trends, and sharing valuable learnings through expert discussion and analysis. It's made up of seasoned experts with decades of experience across a wide range of disciplines. To find blogs, podcasts, webinars, white papers, and more, check out the center by visiting ontic.co slash center. That's ontic.co backslash center. Let's talk about like the big takeaways, you know, within, across, between. How would you summarize maybe some of the big takeaways that you that that you put in the report and you started to coalesce as you were going through the data? Yeah. So I mean I think it always helps to start with the why, doesn't it? And um, you know, as I said, sort of earlier in our conversation, you know, the world's changing and there's lots of different ways that the world's changing, but it let's hone in on a few of them that are relevant to, to what we're talking about. And, and they are that, of course, the external environment as it relates to security is getting more and more difficult. Security risks are rising, fact. Um, geopolitics yes. is, is on steroids, understatement. Um, and one of the other interesting realities, um, which relates entirely to the connectedness debate, is the fact that the kind of risks that companies face are increasingly interconnected. Um, and what business leaders that I interviewed for the other report said is, you know, they're increasingly wanting a more unified view of risk. And what I mean by that is not that they are looking for a simplified view. But that instead, yes. what they want is their leaders across different risk functions to collaborate better, to do some of the initial sorting of the data better before they get to exec common board level. Um, you know, so that so that the the sort of the risk data that is presented at that level is is a bit more integrated, a bit more unified, and is cognizant of the ways in which one risk. Um, sort of pinballs off a, another right. risk. Well, I think there's something to that because I, as I read through that and, you know, we've talked, obviously we've talked about this before, but I think about that. It's almost like a, it's almost like an intellectual shot over the bow to many folks who sit in an organization that are responsible for risk that says, Hey, look, I don't care about your silo. We need, we need to have a unified, you know, I need, I, you know, leaders need to be enabled to make decisions on risk our job many times in as a risk leader or a risk practitioner within an organization is to help give insight and give leaders one, what should you be thinking about? And then what are the courses of action that we can help mitigate this? So they can think, they can go back and consider how would we deal with this? How should I? But I think you're right. A lot of high level leaders are are now at a point where they're like, there's so much information. There's so much data. I need y'all to work together. I need y'all to connect and present 
you know, a one pane of glass view of risk or problems to enable me to make decisions. What am I missing in that? No, I mean, that's, that's exactly it. And, um, you know, they, of course, companies have to have a risk register and, and many are regulated um, to, to do so. Um, and a, a, I guess I guess what we're both saying is that a shopping list of risks ain't much use mm. anymore because mm. um, it's about the, you know, a, 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 you know a, a company can have a corporate security function and a cyber security function and a compliance function and a this and a that and the other function. And it's really important that each of them does as much of their own work well as they can. And there's a certain amount of risk that they can um, contain, mitigate against on their own. Um, mm -hmm. What should be really keeping uh, senior leaders up at night is the stuff that falls between the gaps. It's the stuff that sort of ricochets around the company um, and that starts in cyber and finishes in you know physical and does a quick detour around financial yes. risk and and then you know lands squarely on the you know on the desk of the, the chairman. So um, it's 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 really really complex, and we we as security professionals don't need to convince our senior leaders of that. I mean, you've only got to look at the World Economic Forum's annual report, amongst many others that are produced annually. Huge surveys of CEOs globally. They're saying mm -hmm. this as well. I mean, that you know, I spend most of my time reading the business press and not the security press. Um, so we don't need to convince them of, of that. The challenge is how do we as a profession, how do we as a function find ways to collaborate um, across the business? And, you know, I'm increasingly talking about the limitations of what I call water cooler collaboration, you know, right. chewing the fat next to the water cooler or, you know, the kitchen bench or whatever it might, you know, whatever the virtual version of that is. That's that is important. It's about the stuff of building relationships, making unexpected connections. Don't want to underestimate that at all. But it's it's not it, it's the start, but it's not the end of this. And um, you know, locking in really effective governance processes and relationships between functions that go beyond personality and go beyond you know in, an individual's tenure is 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 increasingly important going forward. Well, it's interesting. I think about this unified approach, you know, and, you know, it probably requires intentional focus on areas like recruitment, training, external networks. What in talking and as you put the report together, you talk to, to CSOs and security leaders and practitioners from all over. I mean, do you have any any ideas or recommendations you might give security leaders who are looking to implement the kind of changes that are in the report within their own teams? Because you you got to overcome that potential resistance and get that long term. You know you've got to get long term buy in and trust from stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, there there are a lot of recommendations in the report, so I won't rehearse them all. But um, you know, the the first is about talent, and mm -hmm. and and that can be unpacked in a number of different ways. And so, you know, on talent, firstly, it's about making sure that you have people in your function who are capable of collaborating, which sounds like a, a sort of a largely absurd statement, doesn't it? But but it but it's not because there are there are certain people, there are certain skill sets which are better equipped to collaborate, to um, manage complex stakeholder relationships, to, you know, share information, you know, use sharing protocols. There's all sorts of um, different qualities that people bring to their job, and some some people are better at that kind of stuff, and and others are more suited to you know individual work or small you know groups or working with professionals with the same sort of expertise. So it's it's really important to get people into the function who have got those collaborative um, skills and qualities. Um, it's it's also really important once you've got them in to make sure that you're running your team through an inclusive leadership style because right. it's all very well those people sitting in the office together. If you have a leadership style and a team management style that is still very top down um, and is not inclusive, you won't get the benefit from them. You know, if you're not right. empowering people to go out across the business and make friends, think about how they can use their external networks to not just benefit their own work, but to maybe benefit the work of colleagues in other functions around the business so that, you know, the function is adding value 
across the value chain. And then, um, and then thirdly, having a really long term view about about the talent strategy. You know, who are you getting in? How are you getting them in? Where are you finding them from? How are you developing talent? How are you helping those who are not maybe naturally um, inclined towards that collaborative approach? How are you developing them? Professional development training, et cetera, opportunities that you can that you can provide them with. So there's there's all sorts of um, on the on the kind of the talent side of things. Um, many things that that we can start working on now that will make a tangible difference. Rachel, let me ask you a question. So uh, let's just a quick scenario. I've called you on the phone. I'm a, I'm a CSO or secure. I'm a security leader and I want to do all these things, but Rachel, I'm, 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 I'm a working security leader. I'm on the road with the executive. I got to go do this. Sometimes I think we almost wear the business as a badge. So what's the, what's the, comment that we should give to people like i'm i want to do this stuff i'm just so busy doing my job how do we get around that well i think firstly i would say that is there is some legitimacy in that pushback because you know i i i am the first to admit that collaborating takes time i mean it's not a a time neutral activity and it's exhausting and it's exhausting and people are really irritating (laughs) going accounts (laughs) I'm, you know, we're still trying that with guy. them, right? It's so it is. It is not. Um, it is not time neutral. It takes time. It takes resource. You know, you will have doors closed in your face. So I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sort of claiming that this is. This is all, right. almost always easy, right? So there are difficulties. There are frictions involved in collaboration, and so if you are that person who is stretched beyond stretching, it's about prioritization. You know, in the yeah. in the in our report and in others I've written, you know, I talk about the various different ways in which you can collaborate across your business. Um, you don't have to do all of them. I mean, you need to, you know, maybe choose one and start there um, and choose yeah. one thing that is going to be business critical, that's really important to the business, where there's a natural synergy between that function and your function and where you can identify something that's really concrete that you can do together um, and and you start, but you don't try and take on all of the different things that that I'm recommending in the work that I do. You you start small and you grow from there, and and that is your proof of concept for collaboration. And you show in a small way it's worth inviting security in, um, and then you can it gives you the leeway to then um, you know start to ask for additional resource and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it is hard. It takes time, definitely. But I, I think you've said, I mean, I'll, I'll use an, a, like an Americanism here, like small ball in American baseball. A lot of people say small ball wins the game and it works here too. Like you, you aim small, aim small, target small, small wins equal overtime equal big wins. A, for you personally, you feel good. I'm doing good things. The team sees wins. The organization seems wins. You start connecting across uh, stakeholders beca- and um, key partners because they're, they're seeing wins, trust values. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I, and my takeaway from that is that it's possible, even when it feels impassable, it's possible to get over it. You just don't try to do it all at once. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, if I go back to the business value of corporate security, I, in that report, I set out the five business values. Mm-hmm. The first business value is corporate security. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, it is doing that job really well. Um, and, you know, I, I, I go at length in that report to say, don't do everything else at the expense of doing corporate security really well. You know, it is what you're right. there for. It is what you're being paid to do. And it is an absolute non-negotiable that it is delivered at, at an excellence level. Um, yeah. So, you know, don't tire yourself out trying to sort of contribute to the ESG agenda and, you know, solve the supply chain resilience problem for the organization <laughs> and so on and so forth. If you don't have the resources to do what you need to do properly, focus on that. And then as your small ball, I like that. And then just choose the small ball and go for one thing and chip, chip, chip away. Um, and, and over time, hopefully you can grow. I remember, you know, uh, back when I worked at a multinational, we rolled into finance at one point, the CFO telling us like, hey, look, 
you're here to do this job, do that job well first. Just, you know, yeah. do it, understand that your business is security. So I, I love that. Um, we're like two weeks ish out from the, the Antic summit, uh, here in Austin, which I look forward to, uh, sharing a margarita and some queso with you. I mean, yeah, you are an integral part of, of the, of the summit. I don't want to give too much away, but anything you kind of want to tease the audience with in terms of your presentation or, or what's going to be happening. I'd love to, but I'm not giving any secrets away. Um, but what I will, <laughs> what I will say is, what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping to do this year. I'm going to be talking about all of the stuff we've talked about, of course. But um, the question I get asked very often, I don't know if you've ever asked me this, Chuck, but you're you're allowed to, is how did HR do this? Mm, you know, mm-hmm. twenty, thirty years ago, HR was called the corporate cop, right? And yep. over over 20 or 30 years, they've gone from the corporate cop to being at the right hand of the CEO. And uh, I keep getting asked this question and I thought I'm going to have a go at answering it um, because I think I it, it connects to it connects to what I'm saying, which is here. Here is the business value of your function. That's what mm-hmm. HR was really good at doing, amongst other things, was articulating in business terms their added value to the organization and so um in talking about the you know this the work that i've done and the data and so on that's the lens i'm i'm coming at it from is if they can do it why can't we let's look at how they did it and then let's do the same yeah i love that i'm ready let's do it tomorrow (laughs) Uh, Let's do it tomorrow. No. Why not? <laughs> well, Rachel, how do most people I think probably listening are already following you and following following the Clarity Factory? But if not, where might one find all this goodness that's being produced? All this nerd goodness from the Clarity Factory. The the nerdery can be found. <laughs> um, so our website our website is claritifactory dot com, and um, we. We have a monthly newsletter, and it's honestly no more than monthly because um, I don't want to clog up people's in. So quality over quantity. Um, And if you sign up to that, follow us on LinkedIn, you'll get all of our research. Our research is always free of charge. It's always publicly available because, you know, going back to where we start, my mission is to help make things better. So everything's in the public domain. And, um, yeah, we love love getting new followers and, and interacting with them. Awesome. I love it. Rachel Briggs, thank you so much for being on the Ontic Protective Intelligence Podcast. Thank you for having me. This episode was brought to you by the Ontic Center for Connected Intelligence. Learn more at ontic.co slash center. Again, that's ontic.co backslash center. It was produced by A.J. McKeon. Our music is a track called Monteverde Ride, and it was written by Brian Bristow and performed by the Smokin' Novas. Check them out on Spotify. Please remember to rate and review our podcast on iTunes and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have questions, we'd love to hear them. You can reach us at podcast at ontic.co or visit ontic.co backslash center for more information. Thanks for listening.